bless you uh, this morning as you give. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> Did you hear some of those exciting upcoming events? Uh, I mean, wow. I'm so excited about this ministry team training that's going to be taking place this Tuesday at 7 p.m. And if you, uh, this is your home church, you're a part of this church community, and you would like to be on the ministry team, uh, this, is, this is your moment, okay? So you can just jump right in uh, with both feet. I'm excited to be, I'm going to be there. And, uh, and we really think that God, we really believe God wants to raise people up here to do great and mighty things. And, uh, and so, you know, if that's in ministry, this is a great way to do that, okay? And so you can register online. Um, or, you know, uh, if you don't know how to register, I can help you with that. But uh, make sure that, uh, that you come because we don't do this all the time. You might say, well, I'll catch the next one. Well, I don't know when the next one is, okay? So, so you know, this is your moment, all right? So uh, just uh, if you can, come. Uh, and then Charlie Robinson, our good friend, is going to be here next Sunday. Uh, man, isn't he just awesome? He's such a blessing. Uh, he's going to be here. Uh, and, you know, the other thing I wanted to say is, I don't know if you guys heard or not, but we have an upcoming election. Has anybody heard about this? So tomorrow is the D-Day, right? This is your last uh, time to, uh, to vote. I know a lot of people probably have been pre-voting. How many pre-voted? Okay. Who, who is not going to vote? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, some of you are too young. Um, that's Norm. Oh, you're, oh, you're working. Well, hey, um, what can you do? I guess. Um, I wanted to just encourage people, uh, encourage you to vote based on your Christian values. And we're not gonna tell people who to vote for, of course. But it's like, you know, we're called to be the salt and light in this community, and this is our community. Uh, this is where God has planted us. And so I just want to encourage you, get out and vote. Vote based on, on the way God has, uh, on the values that God has put in our hearts and in our lives. And I think that's incredibly important. Amen? All right. I can tell you guys like that one. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, today is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, man, isn't that great? Uh, of course, we're celebrating uh, the release of the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and we celebrate that today. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit is not optional. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a suggestion, uh, but it's, it's uh, you know, the Holy Spirit working in and through a body of believers is, uh, is um, what God has called for us to walk in as Christians, right? And it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, so the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a seal of our promise, right? Um, it's a seal on our lives. It's a promise of the new covenant in God. And we celebrate that today. Now, if you uh, have been here a little bit, you, we've taught on these feasts before. You know, there are seven feasts in, in the Old Testament that were instituted by God. And uh, some of them are commanded blessings, commanded celebrations. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for you and I, every person here, we're supposed to be meaningful in our life, you know. Uh, a lot of times people can just go through life and there's no meaning, there's no purpose. They're just kind of, you know, sailing through working and paying bills and, and uh, there's really no meaning. There's really no, uh, of course, no one here, right? But, um, but you know what I mean? Uh, it's important to be meaningful in what we celebrate in our lives. Uh, you know, you think of in the Bible, there were so many celebrations, some were you know, two weeks long. Like, when's the last time you had a two-week celebration, right? 
You're like, just last week, I just finished. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you know, one thing I love is the story of the prodigal son when he comes home. The Bible says that the father comes and he takes the fatted calf and he kills it and he makes this proclamation. My son was lost, you know, he, he was dead and now he's here, he's found, and we're going to celebrate um, like he was you know, lost and found now, right? And, you know, I think so many of us would be like that older brother who would say, well, you know, let's just see how he does for a little bit. Let's put him on probation. And by the way, the prodigal son would have been fine with that, wouldn't he? He would have said, oh, okay, that's great. You remember he was reciting his little speech before he went to see the father and it was like, okay, you know, I've failed you and, you know, going through the list. And the father doesn't even let him say his speech. He just comes and hugs him and kisses him, puts the, the ring on his finger, puts the robe around, uh, around his shoulders, and, and, and they kill the fatted calf. And it was just this, this great celebration. Um, uh, and, you know, I think about that. Man, aren't we glad that it wasn't the older brother who went out to meet him first instead of the father? Because it would have went a lot differently. He would have said, man... I, what are you doing back here? You know, we've been working this whole time while you've been out gallivanting around the countryside. And he would have just totally put him in his place or the place that he thought he belonged. But how many know the father was the one who put him in his place, right? He takes him, puts him where he's supposed to be. And so, you know, um, I guess I say all that to say, like, man, we want to have a meaningful life, and we want to celebrate when God does anything. And, uh, and you know, even when things are going bad, it's like, show God that you trust him, and show the devil that he doesn't have any place in your life by celebrating and trusting God anyway. It's like, even though things aren't perfect. So, uh, in Leviticus, let's go there, 23... Uh, verses 1 and 2, it kind of, it's the preface for the feast. And it says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And so it goes kind of through the list. And You know, if you look at that, um, that verse, it's, it, there's a little bit of a hidden message, in a sense, in the verse. And what it's talking about when it says feast, it's this Hebrew word, uh, moet, which means divine appointment, right? And then that word convocations, where it says, you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation, that word means dress rehearsal. It's a, it's a Hebrew word. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, Benjamin, but it's mikra. And... Um, and so, basically, the feasts that they had were dress rehearsals for what was supposed to come. So, you can almost rephrase that passage by saying, okay, um, you know, and the Lord spoke to Moses, says, okay, tell the children of Israel, say to them, these divine appointments of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy dress rehearsals, these are divine appointments, okay? And so, how many have been to a wedding? If you remember, uh, if you're part of a wedding party, usually, it doesn't always take, uh, I recommend this, but you have a dress rehearsal, right? You know, sometimes uh, I'll do a wedding and they'll be like, no, we don't need a dress rehearsal. I'm like, all right, it's your funeral, whatever. <laughs> like, and I mean that as a joke, not, not disparagingly to marriage, but... To, to, it's going to go a little bit bumpy. Uh, the, <laughs> that sounded like I was saying that about marriage. That's not what I meant. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I got to stop here before I get dig myself deeper. Uh, these feasts, they're dress rehearsals for what God wants to do. And so, uh, if you remember Passover, when, you, when they would kill the spotless lamb... Uh, and they would apply the, the blood to the doorpost. Well, the fulfillment of that is with Christ, right, on the cross. Uh, he becomes the slain lamb who, who, uh, who is our redemption. And then, of course, with Pentecost, the institution of Pentecost is when 
we receive the Ten Commandments, which is the seal of the Old Covenant, okay? And then now, when Jesus is, uh, is on the cross, and He dies, and he's, and, and he's risen from the dead, and He goes, and He ascends uh, to heaven, He says, I'm going to give you one. There's a helper who's coming. Uh, and, and He tells the disciples, I want you to wait until you're endued with power from on high. And so they begin to gather. And you know what I was thinking about this morning? Dr. Rudy was talking about, you know, that mighty rushing wind. And, you know, it very much was a suddenly of God. But it was also very much an expectation that something miraculous was about to take place. Because I think they put it together. You know, Jesus died on Passover. He became the lamb. He told us to wait for something coming. Here we are praying, and it's on Pentecost. And we don't know what's going to happen, but we're just here in one accord, just praying. And then all of a sudden, something moves. Now, we, I don't think they knew anything what was going to happen. And Peter gets the language for it right away in Acts 2. He says, you know what? You guys think we're drunk with new wine, but this isn't. This isn't that new wine. wine. We're, this is what Joel prophesied about. Remember? And uh, the, the spirit would fall on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters would prophesy. But I was just thinking about it this morning. It was a suddenly, but it was also something they prepared for. And I'm like, do you get one without the other? You know what I mean? I was just, I'm not making a doctrine around. I'm just, I was thinking about that today because they were prepared. They were obedient to what the Lord had told them to do. Um, and so that is the fulfillment of Pentecost is the release of the Holy Spirit, the seal of the new covenant. Okay. And so we celebrate that today. And, you know, historically, um, Pentecost is a season of change. So historically, this is a time in your life where, you know, maybe God wants to tweak a few things in you, okay? Maybe there's some things that, that you've been, uh, uh, you know, doing. God doesn't want, not necessarily bad things, but, you know, maybe God doesn't have that for you. Maybe he's got something different. Um, so be ready for what he wants to do in your life. That's kind of the, the thought. And, you know, let's go to Acts 2. And, um, how are we doing for time here? Yeah, we've got lots of time. Lots. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is really the story of the Holy Spirit falling on those 120 and how it begins this. Um, it basically begins the wave of Christianity where God begins to build his church. And we start to see it in the early days. It's very, um, it's very pure. It's very uh, special. You remember at the end of chapter 2, the Bible says they sell everything that they have. And they're kind of communally living. And, uh, and they're all like pooling if there's, somebody needs some money. Or it's, it was just like this very... Um, uh, amazing period of time. I, I could see God doing that again. Um, I think. I think the key, though, is there was this deep, deep love and trust for one another, and for the Lord, obviously. But that first day, we see them start with 120, and that it grows to 3,000 new people are added to the kingdom of God on the first day, and they get baptized and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. And really what was so interesting about that season uh, was where God began to download uh, languages. People started to speak in other languages. And during the Feast of Pentecost, just like some of our group here today are in Jerusalem for, or in Israel for Pentecost, people from all of, around the world, from every different nation, every di tribe, every tongue, were in Jerusalem for that feast. And when they saw what was happening in the streets, they were astounded and they were amazed because these people were speaking in their language. 
And they could understand them. How do these people speak in our language? And, uh, and so it was a sign uh, of, of uh, what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. Now he began to move his church out into these different areas. It was almost this prophetic sign of, you know, hey, this is where you're going, I think. But um, anyway, I was reading Acts today, or not today, this week. And so I read out of the New King James Version. Let's hear it for the New King James people. Come on. I'm not going to start a war here over translations. Uh, but you know when you like Google uh, a scripture, it just comes up in whatever translation Google thinks is what you want or something. And, uh, and so anyway, it came out. I was just on my computer. Oh, I'll check out Acts 2, you know, kind of read, read it over. And it came up in NIV. NIV people? Wow. There's... Uh, they're like, I don't know if I'm in the right church right now. I can't. They're going to judge me. Um, amplified. Oh, we got some Amplified. Wait, the classic? Oh, okay. Can you put up Acts 2, uh, verse 23 in the NIV if we have it? I don't even know if we have it. But um, anyway, I was reading it through. And uh, I came to 23, and uh, just something about this first line just hit me. This, speaking of Jesus, this man was handed over to you. And this is Peter kind of preaching to the group, right, that, that had came to gather around saying, what is going on? Why are you guys, you know, speaking in other tongues? Why are you guys laughing? Why is there, you know, what is happening here? They could see something was going on. They could see God was moving. And Peter gets up and he be, be, begins to bring language, which I think is probably an anointing from God on his life. Because, you know, sometimes he would just get stuff before other people did, right? And he'd have, the, remember when they're up in Caesarea Philippi, it's like, well, who do they say I'm? You're the Christ. It's like he just got things. But anyway, I'm reading this. Uh, in, in the NIV, in this first line, specifically the end of it, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. And something about that just really resonated in me. And I wanted to talk about that with you uh, for whatever time we have left. God's deliberate plan. Um, you know, he's had a deliberate plan all throughout history, all throughout the ages. Uh, he has a deliberate plan for your life as well, uh, in that you are designed to be woven into this greater plan of God throughout the ages. And, you know, we see that very clearly from, uh, from the garden to Jesus. Uh, we see that very clearly uh, from the, through the ministry and life of Jesus to the death and resurrection of Christ to the, the seal of, of our new covenant, the release of the Holy Spirit. And then we see it throughout church history leading into a culminating moment. Um, and so, you know, I want to go with you to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to look at uh, just kind of the exciting portion of Matthew chapter 1, which is the genealogy, okay? Okay. I'm kind of being a little sarcastic there. As, just because most people kind of skip over this. Um, but Matthew chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 17, it details uh, the 42 generations going from Abraham until Jesus. Okay, And it kind of breaks them up into... 14 generation periods. So the first one is from uh, Abraham until, uh, or sorry, yeah, Abraham until David. And then the next 14 generations is from David until the exile at Babylon. And then another 14 generations from the exile at Babylon until Christ. So equaling 42. So 14 times 3 is 42. Okay, so you guys have learned something. Um, and I've done all this math for you pre, uh, 
before this is. But if you look at, I think it's verse 17, yeah. So all uh, of the generations from Abraham to David were 14. From David to Babylon, 14. From Babylon to Christ, 14. So they sum it up for you. But uh, I, I don't want to go through the whole thing. Uh, but there's actually only 41. And uh, we used to teach on this all the time in our internship. Um, but you kind of go through the genealogy from Abraham to David. Okay, yes, there's 14 generations. You don't need me to go through it, do you? You can count it on your own later. Um, and then from, from, uh, from David until the Babylonian captivity was another 14, sure enough. And then when you do the last one, from the Babylonian captivity until Christ, there's not 14, there's 13. And you're like, okay, Matthew was not a math guy, okay? We get it. Um, or you're like, okay, is this Bible thing like, you know, how, how accurate is this? Um, right? I mean, no, it's very accurate. And it's on purpose that they skip that 42nd generation. And I'll tell you what. Let's go to Isaiah 53, verse 10. And if you know the book of Isaiah, you will know that Isaiah 53 is a messianic uh, um, prophecy. So in other words, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, it's, it's actually talking about what he was going to endure on the cross. It's the sacrificial messianic uh, prophecy. It's probably the most famous one in, in the entire Bible. Maybe there's a few others in Psalms and, 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 and all of that. But it's really detailed. By his stripes we're healed. Like, you know, it's talking about uh, like a lamb being led to the slaughter, right? All of this is being prophesied. But if you look at verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him in grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin. And then it kind of just. So that's messianic. And then it kind of just goes this. It says this. He shall see his seed. Speaking of Jesus. He shall prolong his days. Um, and we know Jesus didn't have any children. Did he? Um, right? So it's not a trick question. Um, so. Okay, well, what is that verse talking about? Okay. And then you go to Colossians chapter 1, and you begin to get some language for, for more of this. It says in verse 27, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Holy Spirit in you. Um, so, I'll just make this really easy. Jesus is counted twice. Okay? He's counted once when he comes, lives, and dies. And then he's counted again when he comes and lives and indwells in, in his people. All right? And so that's what it's talking about when it says that he will see his seed. And you know what? Even, um, even in Psalms, it, it talks about it too, right? Um, so I don't want to get into this whole sons and daughters uh, message, because I actually want to talk on that God's deliberate plan. But I wanted to just read this one uh, verse out of, if you can put it up, Matthew 5, 44 and 45. And there's a few other ones. Uh, you know, and we, as a church, we talk quite a bit about identity, right? Uh, you know, God really has called us to be comfortable in our skin and who he created created you to be and as a son or a daughter of the living God right uh, all of that but you know this is from the Sermon on the Mountain so Jesus is kind of teaching us about um, loving our enemies I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So, you know, when I read that, I don't know if anybody else has this reaction. It's like, ah, like, I'm not there yet, Lord. Like, I want to get there. Anybody else? 
And, and that's, by the way, that's not a, you know what, I just got to do better sometimes. That's a, that's a place of, of being connected to the living God. That's a place of being rooted and grounded in his love where it's like you become unoffendable. You become uh, where it's just like, you know, you can just walk in such a deep level of love that you can actually pray for the people that have wronged you. You can bless them. You can love them. Um, you don't have to keep track of everybody. You know, some people, it's like, you know, it's you're still gunning for that person from the eighth grade that, you know, did something wrong. It's like, oh, when I get my chance, I'm coming for you. But anyway, um, God's deliberate plan throughout the ages. We know it all starts in the garden. And we see um, God begins to uh, make something new. And he makes Adam. He makes Eve. And he has this wonderful garden. It's perfect. Everything's exactly. uh, They love each other. They love God. You know. It's just it's just paradise. And, uh, and it all goes wrong. And we see, you know, the serpent comes in and he deceives Eve. and They eat of the apple and, and, and kind of everything explodes. They're pushed out of this garden. And, you know, God actually says a promise. You know, he's, God very often has like a solution before you have a problem to what you're facing right now. And, uh, and he kind of begins to prophesy over uh, Eve. And if you remember, it's in Genesis 3. You know, he, said, basically, he basically says, okay, I'm going to put enmity between, uh, between your seed and, and, and the woman's seed. And he shall bruise your head. Speaking to Satan. So Satan has, like... We got to, I think we give him too much credit here because he has no grid for anything that's about to happen. All he knows is, oh, God is kind of, he's fallen from heaven. God has created this little nice spot here on earth. He's got a little garden there. He's got, he created these two perfect beings. And let's just go mess that up. And he goes in there and he kind of deceives her and kind of figures out the, the parameters of what's happening, knows that they're not allowed to eat from this tree. So what does he do? He tries to convince her to do it. And then he hears this word. Okay. Her offspring, are, they're going to step on my head. Okay. What, what does that mean? Now he's like trying to figure this all out. And then what happens? Adam and Eve, they have two children, Cain and Abel. And it's almost like it doesn't take him that long to figure out, okay, we got to stop this Abel guy. (laughs) You know, he's he's the one, I think. And so what does he do? He puts envy, he puts jealousy, he puts strife uh, in Cain's head, and he commits murder, the first murder. Um, And uh, the blood cry, you know how the story goes. He's banished out. Now here is uh, Adam and Eve. They have, they have this disappointment, you know. Look at what happened to our, our son. And the Bible says that God gives them a substitute, Seth. And so now we have these two lines kind of running on the earth. We have the, the Can- Canaanites and we have the Sethites. And they're kind of growing now. And, and uh, things get worse. I'm not sure... How ready you guys are for Genesis uh, 6. But, you know, we see now the Nephilim's coming. It's like they're corrupting this this race. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? It's just going bad. And people start doing all these wicked things. And uh, except for one family, Noah and his, and his six or whatever it was. Uh, or seven, wasn't it? Um, and And so... We kind of see, again, the devil's plan. Let's corrupt or destroy. 
And sure enough, he does a pretty good job at it until the point that finally God says, okay, let's start this whole thing over again. And so he starts over with Noah. And now, okay, things start to grow again. And uh, things are moving along. And uh, he begins to speak to another person, Abraham. And he makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And it's almost like the devil's radar now. Abraham's on his radar. Okay, we got to stop this guy. And you guys know these stories. Like, this just happens again and again. And, you know, Abraham, it's like, what's the first thing that they face? Um, Sarah is, is barren, the Bible says. She can't have kids. And now, so they're trying, and it's not coming to pass. And then now she's getting too old. She's like 90. And, uh, you know, one day God shows up to their door, and, and they have this conversation, and and, you know, remember the story? It's kind of about Sodom and Gomorrah and all this stuff. But he gives them a promise. Within one year, I'm going to come back here, and Sarah's going to have a son. And she laughs in the temple, remember? Or in the, in the tent, thank you. Close enough. Um, and, uh, and so they actually call Isaac that because it's laughter, right? Um, and, uh, and so... But anyway, that, that year was a year from hell. How many have ever been through a year of hell? This was a year from hell on steroids, you know. It was like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, Lot is lost. They have all these contention. They have all these problems. Sarah gets stolen again, this time by Abimelech. So he's one of Abimelech's concubines. And, uh, and uh, you remember the dream that Abimelech has? It's a great dream. <laughs> You know, when Paul Keith was here in December, he, met, he actually preached on that story. And uh, how many were here for that? It was so funny. But uh, just about the idea of free will. Like, okay, God, you know, he definitely gives us a free will. But when he w goes to Abimelech, he says, listen, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. But just so you know, if you touch her, I'm going to kill you and everyone that you know. So, you know, but you can do what you want. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, which is just kind of funny. And, and we know the story. Uh, she, he has this dream that next morning he gets up, runs down, and like just turns it all around. I'm so sorry, you know. Um, and that year, uh, sure enough, comes and the son of promise comes. Now Isaac is grown and, and he wants a, uh, he's ready to start his family. He finds a wife. Um, and, and so they get married and now, She's barren, and she can't have kids. It's the same kind of thing. Okay, what's going on? And then it just, just um, you know, and then he, he has the twins, and, and these twins, the Bible says there's a war inside their, in, in their mother's womb. They're battling. You remember when Isaac comes out, he's hanging on to Esau, or sorry, Jacob comes out, he's hanging on to Esau's foot when he's born. And, you know, because in that day, it was really important about inheritance, right? If you were the firstborn, that was a big deal. That means you inherited everything, basically. And it's almost like God changes the rules here, though. And he just says, you know what? We're going we're gonna to go with uh, the younger this time, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Aren't you glad when God changes the rules for your favor, for your benefit, and that's kind of what he does. And, you know, they go through. They go through hell. They go through problems. And finally, when things are starting to go good uh, for Jacob, then he has his, uh, his son, he believes, gets killed by an animal. And then, of course, we know it's Joseph. He goes into Egypt, and now he's in Egypt. And, and all of this is by design from God. Of course, God doesn't cause these problems, but it's by design. And so now when, you know, their, their tribe is growing, now there's about 70 people in the, kind of in the extended family type of thing. All of a sudden, there's this huge famine that comes onto the land. And guess who 
God had already sent ahead of it to prepare. See, he's already creating the solution for the problem that they were going to face in that he had Joseph there with the wisdom and the character and the integrity to walk the rest of them into Egypt. And so now they're in Egypt. Some time goes on. Joseph dies. A new Pharaoh comes that doesn't know Joseph and begins to see this kind of ethnic group within their population growing and thriving to the point that now they become scared of them and they begin to subjugate them and actually put them into slavery. So now they're slaves of the Egyptian people. And so as, as they're slaves, nothing uh, changes. They still begin to, they're still growing. They're still thriving. This nation is doing well. And actually, we find out in, in uh, Genesis that there was a prophecy that God gave to Abraham that his lineage would stay in Egypt for 400 years. How many remember that? And so now we're starting to come up on the tail end of that promise. And so the devil knows, okay, I have to do something because right now in this situation, I can manage them, okay? And so if I let them out and they get their own thing, I can't manage them. And so what does uh, Pharaoh begin to do? He starts to kill all the, all the baby boys. And they think if we can kill these baby boys... In a, one generation, we'll wipe them all out. And that's the plan of the enemy to stop it. And of course, you know the story. It doesn't work. God delivers them. He brings Moses, who is this promised deliverer. Uh, he raises him in the most ironic way, which is that one day when this law was being instituted, you know, uh, Miriam just sends him down the river Nile, and all of a sudden, here's this princess in the palace who had always uh, wanted a child. I'm not sure if she had what the situation there was, but here she sees, okay, this is my provision. This is what I need. And so she thinks it's an answer from God for her. And so now here he is in the palace. And God just is weaving all of this uh, into his design, even, even, uh, even, um, you know, Moses' season in the wilderness of 40 years was a prerequisite for leading the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. See, all of this is kind of weaving together by God's design. We see that when the children of Israel leave Egypt, uh, they come out with all the provisions. But not only that, the last plague that God does on, on, uh, on the people of Egypt is the death of the firstborn. It was almost like they started with killing their babies. God finished it. You see that difference? And, uh, and so it's all kind of weaving together. And as they're in the wilderness for those 40 years, it's like the devil raises up every single uh, nation he could to try to fight them. You remember, they go through this season of it's like every weekend, they got a battle they got to contest. And, you know, it really does say something. And, it, and I think it says this is like, if you're going to walk in the promises of God for your life, you're going you're gonna to be contested too, okay? I think it tells us that. Um, but anyway, they come out of the wilderness. They go into the promised land. God begins to set up these boundaries. And, uh, and uh, you know the story. They go through the cycle of the judges where, you know, they sin. It's almost like if you heard that uh, pattern, it's like, Strong men make good times, good men make, or good times make weak men, weak men make bad times, bad times make good, uh, strong men. How many have seen that? A little meme. All right, okay, one of you, good. <clears throat> well, that's kind of the same thing. We would see this cycle during the period of the judges where it was like they would get themselves in trouble because of sin. Then they'd have all these problems. They'd cry out to the Lord, and then God would raise up a deliverer. He would reestablish their covenant with the Lord, and then they would kind of just do this cycle. And it just, it just started happening all the time. And what we, began, what we see happen is at the end, the last judge was Samuel. And at the end of his lifespan, they say, you know, we're just tired. We're tired of, like, relying on God to take care of us and to, to, you know, help us. Let's just have a king. And so you know the story. They have, they have uh, Saul. And then when Saul um, doesn't listen to the Lord, God chooses another man. And this man 
is a, a man after his own heart, and he makes a covenant with David. And he says, you know, basically, there's always going to be a king from your line sitting on the throne. And of course, we know that the fulfillment of that is with Christ. But that line now got the enemy's attention. And he's like, okay, that's it right there. And so we've seen kind of how he's methodically attacked uh, what God was doing throughout the ages. And now he sees this one and, okay, David's too good. Can't stop him, although he tried. All right, Solomon, too good. We can't stop him. And then it's like, you know, Rehoboam, it's like it starts to kind of get a little bit easier. And now, you know, they're giving ground up to the enemy. And things get worse. And, you know, the big culmination happens where the devil almost completely wipes out the line of David except for one one-year-old boy. And that's Joash. If you remember, this is too much information. I'm like going a lot into this. <laughs> just realizing I'm just doing the entire Bible today. So just we're doing the whole Bible. We're going to go through everything. <laughs> so it kind of starts in this story with Jehoshaphat. If you remember Jehoshaphat, he's the king of, of Judah. Now at this point, this, the nations are fractured. Judah, Israel, two nations. And up north we have Ahab and we have his, his wife Jezebel. And so they're like, you know what? Hey, guys, I know we don't see eye to eye on everything, but we're still kind of the same. So let's, let's kind of grow together closer. How can we do that? And they come up with a plan. Well, hey, why doesn't my son, this is Jehoshaphat, marry your daughter Athaliah? Well, this was a big mistake. Huge mistake, because as you know, Jehoshaphat was just, or uh, Jezebel was just a total mess, right? And uh, anyway, it's like things get bad. Uh, now Jehoshaphat dies. Now his son, he dies at 40. And now his Athaliah, and, and is it Jehoram? Their son is running the show, but he's even worse than all of them. He's wicked. He's evil. He's like 20 years old, running the kingdom. He gets into a big fight with uh, Jehu. He dies. And so now, all they have is really just this, like, like young kids and Athaliah. And so what does Athaliah do? She goes, because she wants all the power to herself, she goes and tries to kill every single person in King David's line, including her own grandkids. She tries to murder her grandkids, and she would have exceeded, uh, or she would have succeeded if it wasn't for uh, Jehoshaphat. So this one lady, let me just make sure I got these names right. Hey, I'm like, I always worry I'm messing this up. Yeah, Jehoshaphat, I got it. <laughs> she... Uh, She hides Joash for six years. And it's just this really incredible story of how during these dark years, everyone thinks the line of David has been completely destroyed. The promise of God on his life uh, didn't come to pass. Everyone thought that. And then all of a sudden, at the right time, God flips the script. And here is Joash. Come on. Yeah, that's a great clapping spot. That's great. Um, and I just love that, because, and we talk about this uh, so often because Jehoshaphat, her name means the Lord is an oath. It's almost like God keep, kept his promises by having a lady in place whose name was the Lord keeps his promises. This is so funny how God works. And so, you know, sure enough, that line endures. Then we go through, you know, these other periods of destruction where, you know, the, the temple is destroyed, the city is destroyed, and there's really no... Uh, there's no ruler, there's no uh, reigning authority in, in the land. And we go through this really incredibly difficult period where they're all scattered around. And even while they're scattered, we see under Esther that they're almost destroyed. And so it just keeps going and keeps going. And then God begins to speak to Daniel. And he says, okay, here, there's coming a time when I'm going to raise up this Messiah. And he kind of puts a timeline on it from when the temple was to be restored, right? 
And so now we see that's being restored. And it's like, okay, the clock has started to tick. God's going to do something in, in a certain amount of time. And I'm just going to kind of go through this real quick because this is taking way too long. Um, but it's building, it's culminating. And all of a sudden now at the, at the season of fulfillment, Jesus comes onto the scene. And he comes with the message, right? And he, be, and he goes, he, he has a three and a half year ministry and he goes and dies on the cross. And the devil does every single thing that he can, throws every single thing at Jesus to try to destroy him. And he thinks he wins on the cross. And he's celebrating this big victory, uh, you know, when Jesus dies. And then all of a sudden he gets this knock on the door of hell. It's him. <laughs> he's come to take the keys, right? <laughs> and so it culminates. And, and it comes to this point of fulfillment. So all, and it, it's just so poetic because it starts in this garden and it just, it ends in the garden tomb. You know, it's just like this full culminating thing that, you know, God is just so great like that. And, uh, you know, here he is in the garden tomb at the end. And so it's this culminating moment and he tells us, okay, just wait. Okay, I want you to gather together and wait because I'm going to do something new. And all of a sudden, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. And it begins to move again. And now they're getting persecuted. And it's all a part of the design, though, because now they're being scattered to every corner of the world, preaching the gospel, demonstrating the works of the kingdom. Um, all of that started at Pentecost. Chapter 8 of Acts, we see them getting persecuted and getting pushed out. Why? Because God wanted to take it on the road. Okay? See, because what the devil was trying to do, this is what he does. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? That's all he's, he's trying to do. Okay, I got to stop this next wave, whatever this is. And so it goes from the upper room until now. God begins to scatter his saints across the world. And it begins to grow and it begins to flourish. You know, for 300 years after Christianity, um, it was quite a ride. Every single emperor for over 300 years starting with Nero, persecuted Christians constantly. And, you know, put them in the, you know, throw them in the Colosseum, have them ripped, ripped in half, whatever it was. I, I don't want to get too graphic. But, um, but, you know, it didn't stop the church at all. In fact, if you would take an estimation from the moment... Uh, of Pentecost to about like 350 AD, the church every year was growing about 40% year over year, compounded. So, you know, I don't know how many people are here, maybe 200. So next year, 280. Year after that, whatever it is, <laughs> year after that. But, you know, like compounded on that, so 400. And then it gets to like a critical mass where 40% of a million or 20 million is quite a bit now. And they say by about 350 AD, 57% 50, of the Roman Empire was Christian. <laughs> and then, of course, <clears throat> I can't go into all this. This is way too long. But, you know, then we have Constantine who kind of, you know, uh, comes onto the scene. And it's kind of an interesting thing, though, because if you look at the pattern of how the devil tries to do things, it was like so clear with Christianity in the early days that he just was persecuting them. And it, and it really was like the capstones on the end, like Nero and then Diocletian. So the emperor right before Constantine was really brutal for 10 years it was a constant assault on Christianity. Any person who was Christian was getting captured and killed. 
And then at that moment, once Constantine becomes emperor, it's like a, a switch turn. And now it's like, okay, Christianity is now the religion of, of Rome, the Roman Empire. And don't, you know, a lot of, a lot of I don't want to get too much into this today, but a lot of false doctrines crept into the church then. Um, and actually, in my view, it, it is part of the reason why we went into the Dark Ages type of deal. And then you start to see as we're coming out of that, it's like God begins to restore a lot of these truths back to um, his church. You know, we see the, the during the Reformation, right? We see uh, Luther where the doctrine of justification now begins to be, uh, hey, you know what? We, we can live in a justified state by faith. Now that's like a foundational thing for every one of us. But back then, that was heresy. You guys okay? Okay. <laughs> you know, and then we see sanctification begin to take place. Then we, then we start to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to be restored. And now we start to see like healing. That's our bread. That's, we believe that God can do that for every person, right? We start to see prophecy. All these different things getting restored back to the church, the fivefold ministry, you know, the church being uh, functioning the way God created it to function. I think it's being restored, uh, apostolic, right, and all of that, um, <clears throat> leading us to today. Rose, why don't you come? Um, God's deliberate plan throughout the ages you know the devil's always going to do his thing what does he do like we talked about he st steals wants to steal kill and destroy the other thing though we didn't mention is he also really wants to wear out wear down the saints of god we see that in daniel 7 right right if i can just get them worn out uh, doesn't matter what topic it is could be covid could be the election tomorrow. <laughs> He'll wear you out any way he can. Um, get distracted. You know, here's, here's what I want to end with. You know, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, we know it as the hall of faith. Um, it goes through all these different saints that have went on before us. And it goes to verse 39. It says, All of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, <clears throat> did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us that we should not be made perfect, so that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And then it goes on to say this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that was set uh, before you. And you know, what, what does that really mean? It means this. You've, you're grafted into the story of God. And you come from a long line of overcomers. Okay? You come from a long line of people who went before you, who did not obtain the promises why? Because God wants us all to, all to be in it together. And that's what that verse means. In other words, we're in this together. It's a rolling wave, one generation to the next, coming to a culmination. And oh, by the way, you got to volunteer for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I got some more, but I'm going to leave. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for what you're doing throughout all of history. We thank you that we are a part of that story. We're a part of God's deliberate plan. And Lord, for this time, for this moment that we live today, God, we ask that you would give us the grace to run our way race so that we can, along with all others that have went before us, receive the prize, receive what was promised. And Lord, on Pentecost Sunday, we just thank you. We honor your presence. 
we thank you today that you never leave us, that you never forsake us, that you are with us until the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, 